right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight for um, Education Series 2024 from the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Today's um, session is Serving the Migrant Population in Colorado, How the Homelessness Crisis and Newcomer Crisis Intersect. Uh, my name is Alexis Woodham. I'm the Director of Communications, and uh, we really appreciate you coming in. I'll go ahead and get started with a bit of housekeeping. Agenda and format, we always like to give a little overview of um, what the format is for each session. Sometimes they vary a little. This one is pretty typical for us. We're gonna do 10, 15 minutes to tell you a little bit more about the topic, a little data and background information so that we're all on the same page and starting with the same knowledge. Then we're gonna have a panel with some pre-planned questions. Um, and then finally, at the end, we have an open Q&A with about um, 15 minutes to answer questions specifically from you all who are in attendance live here tonight. All right, so first thing we wanna do is we wanna start with a few definitions um, that will help us in our conversation. We have expert panelists who are going to talk and they may talk in some, uh, using some terminology or using some shorthand. Um, and so we just wanna make sure we're all on the same page on what we're saying when we're, when we're saying what we're, um, you know, talking about the folks we're talking about tonight. Um, definitions are complicated. Some may be used colloquially in a way that has a different meaning from the government benefits perspective. So these definitions are mostly from Amnesty and International. Um, that's where we've gotten the definitions we're using on these first um, few slides here. So a refugee is a person who has fled their own country because they are at risk of serious human rights violations and persecution there. The risks to their safety and life were so great that they felt they had no choice but to leave and seek safety outside their country because their own government cannot or will not protect them from those dangers. Refugees have a right to international protection. Um, so that's gonna be our definition for refugees. Uh, many of new arrivals have been granted humanitarian parole by the US Department of Homeland Security with the ability to apply for employment authorization um, but unless otherwise designated as eligible for Office of Refugee Resettlement Benefits, humanitarian parolees are typically not eligible for mainstream public assistance or ORR assistance. So types of assistance people can get are something that's going to come up today. Who's eligible for what? Next slide, please. Um, asylum seekers. An asylum seeker is a person who has left their country and is seeking protection from persecution and serious human rights violations in another country, but who hasn't yet been legally recognized as a refugee and is waiting to receive a decision on their asylum claim. Seeking asylum is a human right. This means everyone should be allowed to enter another country to seek asylum. Next slide, please. Migrants. There is no internationally accepted legal definition of a migrant. In general, migrants are people staying outside their country of origin who are not asylum seekers or refugees. Some migrants leave their country because they want to work, study, or join family. Others feel they must leave because of poverty, political unrest, gang violence, natural disasters, or other serious circumstances that exist there. Unlike the previous two terms, this one isn't really associated with a legal status. Um, and that legal status is what helps people access certain, certain benefits and resources. Um, it's important to note that lots of people don't fit the legal definition of a refugee, but could nevertheless be in danger if they went home. And I also will mention we don't have a slide that says newcomer. Newcomer is a term that we're using to kind of capture people who may fall into one of these categories. Um, and it's it's a term that's being used often. Um, so that's what we'll use for the most part tonight, but this helps to understand maybe we're talking about certain programs eligible for certain people. Um, definition of temporary protected status. So temporary protected status or TPS is granted by the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, to eligible foreign born individuals who are unable to return home safely due to conditions or circumstances preventing their country from adequately handling the return. The US currently provides TPS to over 600,000 individuals. Um, those individuals, who are granted TPS, there are certain countries designated, and those are listed here. I will not read them all, but just um, if you want to take them in. And so clearly, this is a political distinction based on U.S. government interpretation of um, the politics in those countries. And, um, you know, it is not a comprehensive list of places where someone might be seeking refuge from, obviously. So who are the newcomers that we're talking about? We talk about newcomers here. Mostly we're talking about people from South and Central America, uh, including Venezuela, Colombia, Guatemala, and Ecuador. 
Um, many arrive through the southern border in Texas in a traditional way of um, crossing and then were bused to Denver. So, um, you know, usually more newcomers are coming um, into border states and now we're seeing people being more in places that are not near the border and that is due to this busing predominantly from Texas. Um, above all, there are people who are desperate to escape conditions in their home country and had a very long, difficult journey to get here. Um, many of them do not have that TPS, temporary protected status, refugee status, or asylee status. Um, this is the timeline of recent newcomers. So when we're talking and we're talking to our panelists tonight, we're going to mostly be talking about this started in November of December of 2022. That's when we started seeing this influx to Denver and Colorado specifically. You can see here that the highest number um, was actually just a few months ago that we had the highest one in. This is Denver. We'll be talking about Colorado tonight, but we're mostly going to be speaking about Denver. And you can see on this map sort of the peaks and valleys. We know that this is how immigration works. Um, it comes it, it increases at different times for various economic reasons, weather reasons, et cetera. Um, and this is what we've seen in Denver. Thank you. Um, so the scope of the influx. Um, between December of 2022 and today, over 40,000 migrants have arrived in Denver that, that are specific to this newcomer um, type that we're talking about here. Of course, there were other kinds of uh, migrants and immigrants during that time as well. Um, while around half have chosen to move on and receive bus tickets or found other ways to move to a preferred city, many of them have stayed. Um, Denver is currently the single largest recipient of migrants per capita of any city in America. So um, while, of course, more people are being bused to places like Chicago and New York, Denver is a much smaller city. So that's a per capita statement of for the percent of the population um, that, that it accounts for here in Denver. Denver has spent an estimated $68 million on migrant services since December of 2022. For context, the city of Denver budget for 2023 was $1.63 billion. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so why Denver? Why are politicians choosing to put people on buses and send them to Denver of all, of all the places, right? Um, for, because Denver is a self-declared sanctuary city and has expressed a desire to help newcomers to the state. Um, it's also Sanctuary City is a more symbolic gesture than a formal legal status, um, but it does speak to the idea that, um, you know, organizations and government figures in the area are receptive to um, newcomers in a way that those in other places may not. Um, Denver is also one of the largest cities in proximity to Texas. So Texas has many larger cities than Denver, but in proximity outside of that in your nearest, you know, blue state, purple state, um, state with more welcoming um, policies, Denver is, is very close. Thank you. Um, so what do these folks need when they get here? Um, first, shelter and housing needs. We know that is a primary need for all people. And so that's that's the first thing. Um, people showed up and um, it was hard to find places for them, still is, right? So encampments rose up, um, just encampments meaning just outdoor spaces that people are living in temporarily. Um, you know, I the idea is temporarily, right? So um, campsites, tents, things of that nature. Um, also entering shelters, um, both traditional shelters and shelters intended specifically for this population over time. Um, and then short-term housing opportunities. That's all been part of the last 18 months. Um, now there's just one hotel for migrants down from seven. So that's based on need and policy changes over time. And I know that Sarah Plastino will have lots more to say on that, more details. Um, Denver was paying for shelter for nearly 5,000 people in January. That number dropped to 730 for the first week of April. And um, there's also long-term housing opportunities, including assistance with first month's rent from local nonprofits as part of the Newcomers Fund. And I know that Yoli will have more to say about that as we move on. Thank you. So recent changes to local policies. Um, the, you know, since we announced this, um, webinar, things have changed, right? This is a, an ever-changing topic. It's really less than a year and a half old and things are changing quickly. So on April 10th, Mayor Mike Johnst Johnston announced the new Denver Asylum Seeker Program. A few key points, they're going to be on this slide and the next one. Um, eligible individuals include those in Denver's shelter system on April 10th who are potential asylum seekers who have to wait at 
at least 180 days after applying for asylum to receive work authorization. Individuals will be connected to housing assistance options for up to six months, receive legal support to file for asylum and work authorization, cash assistance for food, and a pre-work authorization readiness program called Work Ready. Thanks, Gabriella. Um, and then others who arrive in Denver after April 10th will be provided assistance with travel to another destination. If newcomers need time to plan their onward travel, shelter may be provided for up to three nights. There is no longer any 42-day shelter for families or 14-day shelter for single adults. Um, and then uh, continuing that about work permits, um, the city and county of Denver assist migrants with applying for work authorization. Denver assisted with 1,400 enrollments in the past two months, other legal clinics held by the state of Colorado and nonprofits. Um, increased demand of food banks. We've seen uh, Metro Caring see two times as many visits in January 2024 compared to January 2023. So we think that is related to the influx of newcomers. And Denver Public Schools estimates it has enrolled 3,400 migrant children. So we're talking here about all these ways that new folks, right? There's there's housing needs, and then there's work needs, and then there's food needs, and there's school needs. There's also health needs um, that we'll talk about as well. So medical needs for newcomers, um, care for chronic conditions such as untreated diabetes and hypertension, treatment for infectious diseases, including HIV and hepatitis, dental infections and injuries encountered during their journey. Um, there's also, and, and just to give a little background for those who, maybe this is their first session from the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Some people don't know that we run a federally qualified health center. One of my colleagues will be on tonight to tell us more about that. So some of this information is directly from our colleagues who are working with newcomers. And this is what they're reporting is, is showing up, um, the conditions people have and their needs. So, um, one thing we have is that medications may have been seized by federal, state, or local authorities before folks arrived in Denver. And that's causing a significant unnecessary gap in treatment. So, for example, if someone had diabetes and they had um, medication from their country of origin and they had enough to get them through their journey and then those were seized at some point, um, they're now coming to us and they need all of those things started again. And we know that gaps um, for those types of medicines can be really detrimental to health. So um, that's a major issue that we're seeing. Um, we also are, of course, seeing a need for enabling services. So these are the services around healthcare that help people um, to be to be healthy. So case management to assist in navigation of the immigration process, finding resources, et cetera. Um, federally qualified health centers, community health centers, of which the coalition is just one of many here in the state, are accessible to asylum seekers. So that is appropriate to go to um, community health centers for care, although um, they have different designations. So our designation is specifically to help people experiencing homelessness. Other ones have specific populations they're intended to serve. Um, but community health centers, this is this is what we're designed for, is for people who don't have resource or ability to go um, to more traditional um, places for healthcare. Um, so here at the coalition, we've seen the impact. We we always say we serve about 15,000 people a year in, in healthcare. Um, last year, it was about 17,000, and we presume a lot of those to be newcomers based on um, some of our stats, right? Um, we're having much higher Spanish translation. Um, we're also seeing much less ability to use um, Medicaid for folks. So that's telling us, without us asking people to disclose their um, status, we know based on this information that we're seeing a lot more. Um, it all, we're also seeing a significant increase in demand for pediatric and prenatal care. So um, more children, more um, people who are pregnant needing care. Um, we also had to implement a wait list for new patients just because we had so many new patients and um, want to be sure that we're serving people, our established patients, and then um, adding in after the fact. Um, you know, now we have newcomers and it's been um, a lot at the at the health center to be able to serve everyone. And um, my colleague will be able to speak more to that and, and how we're adjusting. Uh, population comparison. So, um, you know, in some ways, um, the populations we're talking about, we're talking about newcomers. There's a lot in common with people experiencing homelessness that our organization and others have been serving for 40 years. Um, there's differences, but there's also, you know, as I mentioned, there's there's more need for prenatal care, um, more need to get back on medications that were 
confiscated, but there's a lot of similarities between these populations. And as a service provider in the sector, um, it's it's pretty much the same in a lot of ways. Um, there's structural barriers impacting everyone. We have a lack of affordable housing. Um, we have a lack of federal action to solve humanitarian crisis. And we have a lack of services to regain stability. And those services that are eligible to everyone are different depending on their status. And that's what our experts will be able to jump more into. So policy solutions. Um, Unfortunately, no one here today is a member of Congress and able to make broad policy solutions, but we always like to be solution oriented. We know it can be hard to spend time talking about these difficult topics. So what are the solutions that we can talk to our legislators about? What are the solutions we can advocate for? Uh, federal, expanding legal pathways to immigration, providing resources to mitigate the current crisis. So um, those are all things that would be great if there was action from Congress in order to do that that is the most impactful would be federal work. Um, we're not seeing that being super effective thus far. Um, state policy solutions, expanding healthcare options like Omni Salud, cover all Coloradans and emergency Medicaid, as well as supporting healthcare networks that provide low barrier services. So um, that's us, the community health centers, more um, support to those of us doing low barrier services. And finally, locally expanding and improving options for immediate needs like housing, and coordinated response between organizations. All right, so now um, I'm very glad to be introducing our panelists um, who are joining us today. I'll read a short bio on everyone um, and then we'll just welcome you all and um, start our conversation. Um, so Yoli Casas serves as the founder and program director for Vive Wellness. Founded in 2017, Vive Wellness addresses the health equity, physical wellness, and mental wellness needs of communities in Denver, Colorado that face significant health disparities and lack access to physical activity and health education. So welcome, Yoli. Um, Andrew Grimm serves as the Vice President of Integrated Health Operations at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Last year, the coalition served over 17,000 individuals with health care needs in Colorado. Andrew also serves as the President-elect of the Board of Directors for the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Welcome, Andrew. Uh, Sarah Plastino serves as the Newcomer Program Director for the City and County of Denver. In this role, she has been tasked with prioritizing Denver's short and long-term response to new arrivals from the U.S. southern border and their successful integration to ensure equitable access to opportunities and programs across the city. Sarah has spent the past 15 years working with immigrants, refugees, and asylum seekers as a human rights lawyer and advocate. Welcome, Sarah. And finally, Andrea Ryall is a community activist, speaker, and founder of the, non the new nonprofit Hope Has No Borders. She is currently leading a transformative grassroots movement driven by the belief that no matter where you are on this planet, everyone should have the right to dignity, meaningful work, and a way to feed themselves and their children. Andrea is deeply committed to fighting American cultural norms of isolation with healthy community. So welcome everyone. All right, um, Gabriella, will you stop sharing, please? And we can all, awesome, thank you so much. So, all right, what I always like to do to start is um, ask everyone, we just did a long data presentation, um, what, what surprised you? Um, is there anything you think is missing to set the context before we jump into this conversation? Um, tell us, Tell us what you think. This is Yoli. Uh, first, thank you for uh, the introduction and for actually, you got it all right on. I mean, it's the best, it, you know, you kind of touched every point since uh, December 2022. So um, thank you for that. Okay. If no one has anything else, you don't, you know, that's okay. I, if you think, oh, go Andy. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll say, I mean, I think what continues to strike me is just the sheer number of people who have arrived in Denver. I mean, 40,000 is a truly staggering number. Um, and also to see how quickly the systems have had to evolve and change to meet the needs while also recognizing the budgetary challenges that are occurring and how the city has had to shift to now not providing any type of shelter resource, um, which is a big change from where we were at when we started. So those are some of my thoughts going in. Good to see everyone this evening. Thanks for joining us. 
Awesome. Um, we don't have Sarah yet from the city, so I'm going to just work on our questions. I know that in this room, we um, have plenty of answers. And if people have more technical questions about policies, um, we'll do our best. I luckily have a couple folks from my team who work in legislative practice and closely with our local government officials who might be able to answer a couple questions that come up. But for now, I'm very excited to have our community experts in the room and, and we'll go ahead and start there and, and see if um, Sarah comes along. Um, so Yoli, your organization, Vive Wellness, has been assisting individuals and families with physical and mental wellness needs, housing assistance, and more. Um, tell us more about the work you're doing in community and maybe how it's changed over time. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so when we started, it's um, been working with the community, specifically with the migrant community from Mexico that have been here for a while. So we work with, you know, from the COVID on food insecurity, delivering healthy food bags, uh, working with a lot of mental health programs, you know, access to mental health and also creative ways so our culture can feel a little bit um, more, I guess, safe to start with that because sometimes there's a taboo on mental health and especially in the Latino community. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, helping our youth and pathways get some uh, work uh, skills development. So we've been doing it like that. So in December 2022 is when the, re the city reached out because there have been new, 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 new arrivals. Uh, we, we thought, didn't know was, how long it was gonna last, but it was just to kind of get a holiday party going on. And uh, so we started helping them. The children started a transitional school where we would get the kids and uh, pick them up at the shelter, uh, kind of you know work with them in education, math, science, and, and just keep them there for a safe place while the parents look for jobs. And so since then on, uh, we've moved on to state funded, uh, deposit and rent and really just a lot of case work with them. And so we're still going, we're still going through that. And uh, it's been a journey, I guess. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Andrea, your, your work as a community I organizer started with a Facebook group for Highland Moms. And um, that sounds very narrow for those of us who live in Denver. We're like, that's just one little neighborhood and one little demographic of people, right? Um, and now it's expanded significantly to serve our, our newcomer population. Um, Tell us what you're doing outside of the normal government nonprofit structures um, that's assisting folks with food, haircut, story times. Um, why do you feel those are vital gaps to fill? And and tell us a little bit about that journey of how how it turned from from a small thing to a to a big thing. Uh, yes. Um, first, I <laughs> it's like I wish I had a video of myself um, of this moment, and I could show it to myself six months ago because. Six months ago, um, I had no idea that there would be a humanitarian crisis in Denver. Um, I don't come from a background of social work or um, I've never worked with the typically in house before. Um, I'm, I would say just a very typical mom from my part of town and um, from an already kind of healthy community that we have here of moms um, kind of exploded this humanitarian work. And it, it really was just, um, um, moments of me down in the uh, the encampment that used to be at 26 and Zunai um, with my kids with me. Um, and it's just a mom with kids standing face to face with another mom with kids um, and seeing that, uh, that that she needed the same things that I would be asking for if I were her, um, that she loves and cares for her kids and would do anything for her kids in the exact same way um, that I love and care for my kids and would do anything for my kids. Um, so there was this recognition that um, there's just a large population of people who are a lot like us who, who needed help. Um, and a lot of what they needed, we knew we had in mass in our homes. Um, I mean, we're, we're all living in excess, most of us, um, you know, boxes and boxes of, of kids clothes and extra coats, suitcases. Um, those immediate needs were the first uh, first things that we saw that the really tangible low hanging fruit where it was like, you need a coat, I have a coat in my closet, I'll be right back, right? Um, and honestly, th that was a Saturday. Um, four days later, we had our own Facebook group and it exploded. Um, there was within four days, there was a thousand members on the group. Um, and then at 12, at 12 weeks, we were at around 6,000. And that was early February. And today we're up over 8,000 members in the group. Um, I kind of explain it as an accidental uh, grassroots movement, um, but it's really born out of just the complete love and and 
heart of this community to care for each other. Um, this is a moment where government likes to draw lines and and decide, you know, who can do what where and who feels a certain way here versus somewhere else. And as citizens, we don't have those lines. We don't have borders that divide us. And um, that's why this movement has spread from this tiny little community and been this little demographic of moms. Um, you guys are probably hearing my five-year-old digging around in the fridge right now. Um, why it's changed from this little kind of this little neighborhood thing to spreading across Metro Denver. There are members in Summit County, Parker, um, you know, Wheat Ridge, Lakewood, every part of Denver, Aurora, uh, like this is this is a grassroots movement of people in our state who who care and want to want to see this moment done well. So that's kind of where that's the standpoint that I come from um, and the work that I've been doing since early November. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so, Andy, the presentation covered some ways that migrants have some different needs from the population. that The coalition has primarily served for the last four decades. Tell us more about how we serve all people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Sure. Uh, thanks, Alexis. And as Alexis mentioned, uh, CCH operates a community health center, um, also known as a federally qualified health center or FQHC. Um, you'll hear those acronyms. So we uh, receive funding through the federal health center program. Um, and we are unique in that we are funded as a healthcare for the homeless and public housing primary care grantee. We are the only special populations only focused health center in the state of Colorado. All of the other 19 health centers have a broader mission to care for the broader community that is underserved, whereas CCH is really focused on meeting the unique needs of people experiencing an at risk of homelessness and also who live in permanent supportive housing and other public housing. So we uh, operate several sites, but our primary location is at the Stout Street Health Center, where I'm sitting right now tonight. Um, it's at 2130 Stout Street, uh, not too far from the heart of downtown Denver uh, in Five Points. And uh, really, I wanted to take us back to where our journey really started. I would say not necessarily totally started, but was an event that made us realize, I think, what was potentially coming. Um, so in December of 2020, um, on a day that was blustery with cold in the negative temperature, negative digits. We had 50 Venezuelan refugees show up at the front door of the Stout Street Health Center. And they had been dropped off at a bus station nearby the health center um, after being put on that bus in Texas. And many of them were in t-shirts and had no coats and didn't have the right shoes and this was a group of parents and kids and folks who had been on a, a really long journey and were just looking for somewhere to get warm and not necessarily looking for healthcare services when they showed up at our door. We just happened to be a place that was open and welcoming and let them come in and we created a kind of makeshift migrant reception center in our community room and our staff gave out food and hot drinks and connected a lot of people with who had some immediate healthcare needs with healthcare and our nursing staff were there. But that's when I was really the first sign of this influx that was coming in December of 2022. And then all through 2023, we continued to just see a rapid increase in the number of asylum seekers who were presenting for healthcare services and really in all of our sites, but primarily at the Stout Street Health Center. Um, and I mean, we've talked a little bit about the needs that these folks are coming with. I would say that in general, they have many of the same healthcare needs as you or I do, or as people experiencing homelessness who have been in Denver for many years do. They 
all of us suffer from chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. Um, and so we're the, the seizure of medication at the border has been a huge detriment to people's health. I mean, imagine if you were set up with your hypertension meds that were keeping your blood pressure under control or you had your insulin and all of a sudden that was taken from you for no real apparent reason other than to make your life harder. Um, these are not drugs that anyone would consider to be drugs of abuse or things that were at risk of being sold in the United States. So it is just totally nonsensical that the government is seizing these medications. And so we've had to get people back on meds that they've been stable on for quite some time. And that takes a big toll on someone's overall health when their chronic diseases aren't being treated. And then like many of our other uh, patients who are experiencing homelessness, we see a lot of injuries that happened as a result of the journey. You know, people have wounds that need to be cared for because they've been walking in the same pair of shoes in harsh conditions for many months. Um, so it's not all that different from what we see among the people who are traditionally seeking services from CCH, lots of need for case management and other resources. And so we're really, we've been uh, able to really step up and provide the services, but it's it's been a significant challenge for us. And I can go into that a little bit more, but we'll pause and see if there's other questions at this point. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, and you sort of alluded to um, the differences and, you know, serving different populations over time. Um, Yoli, maybe you can talk a little bit also about, you know, your organization was um, serving, as you said, mostly folks from Mexico previously, and then now there's been a shift. Like, how are you all adjusting to serving different populations? And what are you seeing with some of the other organizations who work in your sector on um, how you've had to kind of switch, you know, obviously immigration has been around for hundreds of years and uh, we're all on land that used to be Mexico, but um, you know, how, how has your approach changed in this last um, 16 months or so? Absolutely. Um, many ways, actually, you know, it's been, I think I could honestly save all well, my 40 years here in Denver and uh, doing a lot of this work. It's been the hardest time for us and for me specifically emotionally. Um, you know, sometimes what we see is, you know, the families that usually come from closer to the border, they have families here. So they have somebody where they meet, uh, even if it's like 15 of them in a room and they assist each other. What we've seen is with this community, um, they don't know anybody. You know, they're coming all the way from Venezuela and they walk and they have journey and their families are the ones who arrive with them. And so, you know, many times they show up and they go, you know, this is my family or these are my family. There are six, seven or eight of them. And I, you know, I kind of went on with the city at the beginning is like, that is their family. They have walked for, for three, four, five, six months. The children have walked together. They have seen, you know, a lot of uh, hard things, especially children since we've seen them. And so it, it has changed the way, you know, we have had a, a different team. Is a change where a lot of our staff has had and have to have a lot of self-care um, you know, even up to today, we, you know, every day we, since the first day we welcome people and we meet them at the shelters at that time was a rec center and to hear stories. And so we adapt according to what they need. There's a lot of more um, trauma that we need to work with. A lot of people in our programs now, we have therapists in our programs with our children uh, because you never know how the reaction will be. So we have had that, the, the you know, we deliver, um, we serve 1500 uh, families, uh, food bags every other week or every week. And so those are the families are newcomers right now. And so we've had to have a lot of more help. We changed the type of food, you know, different people eat spicy Mexican or Venezuela as well. I grew up in Venezuela, but I think I'm Mexican more now, but they don't eat spicy. So they, so we've had to change different ways. And also I want you to understand and, and understand that, you know, the, at least 20 years ago, since, you know, Chavez came to our country, you know, and I think it's really important to understand this. Um, the people who have lived in Venezuela right now, it's different when I lived there. There's a different way where everything is handed for free, right? You have food, you have healthcare, you have housing. So, and there's only one TV station. And so you don't know what's going on on the outside. So they come back 
just knowing that, knowing that maybe the government needs to give you that and they haven't developed some of that ways of what it is to be responsible and not because it's their fault, it's just the way that where they live, right? And so they have left that place because there's no food, there's a lot of problems going on. And so they, I think what we've had to do, which is beautiful, is just have those conversations about, hey, you know, how do we make it here? This is a different way. These are rules. And, you know, so it's been a little different. Our programs are different, uh, but we're here to to help, to help the children. And one of the neat things is, you know, the children now know when they have to listen, they know about the clapping. And I heard them today in school. I mean, and I was like, that's a beautiful thing. You know, how do they get so they can get along and they can belong to the school here and and not be treated differently, right? But they need to learn that there are rules. And the parents, they need to know how things work here, right? And so it has been different. I've got to tell you the same language, but different cultures. Everybody's going through a hard time, every country, but different traumas, perhaps, uh, different ways of education. Um, it's It's been a journey and that's all I can say. So, you know, we've housed almost, we're up to, um, you know, 9,000 people that we've housed over, we have just reached over 2,000 leases and we have seen almost 38,000 people, whether it's to help them with the tickets and stuff. So it's been a, a, a team effort together with the state, the city and many nonprofits. So. Thank you so much for that really detailed answer. I apologize, I'm gonna deviate from our pre-planned -pre questions because I would love to hear more about, like you're talking about helping with leases. I think people, um, would love to know more about like how these opportunities are happening with housing. And so what is that um, in terms of like leasing versus temporary shelters, like you all are involved and, and part of the newcomer fund. Um, right. I know that's a lot yeah. to ask you to talk about it at large. No, you're just one no. organization, but like, Absolutely. yeah, tell, tell us more. So the way we see this is the city has stepped up, you know, when it came to sheltering, as soon as they met it, man, we had, you know, there's a point where there's nine shelters, right? And so they also have those 42 days uh, for the families, two two weeks for the individuals, and so the, the then the state came in and gave funding for two or three organizations. One of them is ours, Papagayo. The list has changed. Many organizations that we come together. And what happened was, we would work to have navigators right before the people had to leave. We would just go to the shelter, and basically the the protocol from the state was, hey, you know, you got to be able to have some kind of jobs. Of course, remember they coming in with no work permit, but like, you know, in any of our country, you know that people find jobs somehow, which is amazing. And so that was some kind of job getting a letter of employment or applying for apartment complexes or some people, a lot of citizens came through and said, I have housing for lease. And so once they do that, they actually get a it's beautiful letter when it says you have been approved for, uh, let's say, apartment complex for this one bedroom. And so they would come and they would sign the lease. But we would actually have a letter from our nonprofit saying we will actually help with the deposit in the first month, month or one and a half month, depending on how much it was. And that was came was funneled through the state. And so that's how we did it. So when you start from December of 2022 through uh, August, uh, the end of August 2023, we were able to house every single person. There was no one in the street. We were housed everybody and the, the funding came down in August and the state came back and said, you know, we we found some housing, so we'll get back to it in September and October. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, the cold weather's coming. More people are coming. We're gonna see people in the street. Let's let's work fast. So newcomers were come and say, okay, let us help you while there's a gap. And so we were all trying to figure out, and then you just write checks after checks after checks because everything's reimbursable. And I have never written so many checks in a week. One time I think it was like 350,000 in one week because we've housed so many people. And so it, it has been a new thing, but that's how it works. So basically the protocol from the state's gotta be families. The city came back and newcomers helped us to help those individuals because we weren't cover them. So that's how we help house and house people uh, and all the way through now. So, you know, we started at 5,000 and I told the team We've got to get these numbers down. So we had like 16 navigators and many of the citizens, including Andrea, would go, okay, how we can help? And they'd be like, we found a house. I said, okay, see if they qualify. We have an apartment. See if you qualify. Okay, here's the lease. And so we write the check. And so I think everybody, you know what it felt beautiful is maybe the first six, seven months we felt it was just us. But then right there, I'm October, November, we, we felt 
the, the warmth of the citizens, of the people, and they're all somehow helping us, um, sending us leases and checks, and, and we were able to get those numbers under a thousand. And I think that's how we were, because I said, if we get those numbers down, perhaps, you know, the city won't need that much money and our citizens will actually get their programs back. And I think that was a motivation for me, at least. That's awesome. Thank you. And I yeah. love the way both you and Andrea talked about like resources already existing for people, right? Some of those people might be in this session right now or watching. It's like, I have a coat or I have a space I could rent, right? Like that there, there are resources in our communities um, that many of us have. So thank you. Yeah. Um, we still need 200 more leases. So if anybody, 200, 220 more families to go. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And um, you know, I think that's another great thing about this session is that I think some, a lot of times people ask us, like, how can I help? And, you know, we always have answers, you know, talk to our advocacy committee, they'll always have an answer for you, um, as will our volunteer manager. But, um, but yeah, we, when we welcome different organizations, they have different answers. So whatever your thing is that you're able to help, um, you know, I know that when we talk later and we say, like, how can, how can people help? Each organization here will have a different answer, and that means every person here can have a different way to respond that feels feels right to them. Um, Andrea, you're a great example of that, and um, tell us more about, I mean, specifically, you know, we've talked about how the, the population is more children, and I know that's part of what you were saying personally motivated you, and I think what motivates a lot of people in your group. So, um, you know, how, tell us more about, like, sort of how you're serving families and children, and maybe more specifics on, you know, how folks can can get involved and, and also assist besides, of course, if you have a space, um, you know, open it up for, for rental. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, the, the moms and neighbors in my community are just, we're not messing around. We're not going to have kids on the street. That's, we, we don't want that. And, and my eyes have been completely open to the crisis in general, uh, in our state. This is not limited to this particular migration crisis. This is a societal issue. Um, and, and virtually everything we're doing um, as citizens, nonprofits, and honestly, at the city level, um, I want to just say that, you know, most of it would not be needed uh, if the federal government was not opening up the doors to a population without the right to work. This is a population who comes um, skilled, who comes ready to work, who does not want handouts. The amount of times I've had to push a coat or boots or help on someone who just does not want to take a handout um, is a lot. You know, they want to work. They just want to work. So I do want I do want anyone who's new to this crisis to understand that the extreme amount, I mean, millions and millions and millions of dollars right now are being poured into a population who wants to care for themselves. And so that's where we find ourselves. I personally cannot go redo the immigration system. I do believe that if we had about 48 hours and a group of moms and grab Yoli, grab my friends at Papagayo, uh, I mean, we could we could boost the economy. We could do it for less. Um, th this is not an unsolvable crisis. It while it's complicated, it's not unsolvable. Um, so I want I want to kind of just start there and just a recognition that no matter where you stand politically, where are you what background you come from? I think we can all agree that the immigration system in this country is broken. And while many things are set up to be deterrents, um, they're not working. And we find ourselves face to face with families and individuals in our city who need help. Um, and so, and so we have to we have to do something about that. We have to take action. I will say that um, the ways in which um, my group in particular has taken action. It's hard for me to speak for everyone I, because it is truly a grassroots movement. Um, there are many individuals acting at will on their own, making their own choices, going down, handing out bananas, going down, um, me making friends making direct connections. I think the most beautiful part of what we've been seeing is there's not some really strict organizational structure here. This is truly individuals acting at will, doing direct service, making a choice to become friends with and invested in another individual or family. Um, I don't know of a migration crisis in our history where locals in mass have made that choice. It's beautiful. It's generationally going to change 
change um, what migration looks like in this community. I'm so excited to see 10, 20 years from now, the kids who are watching their moms, who are following their moms around, who are going and, and who are emptying out their own closets. My kids have given away all their most coveted stuffies, their cars that they love the most, their extra jackets, everything, right? All, all the all the values I've been trying hard to teach them in a moment they learned and it was the moment when they looked dead in the eyes at another kid their own age who has nothing who's no different from them um it is changing our society and, and we, we may not know the impact right now um but it's important to keep going right now so the ways in which we just had a spring and a summer meeting there's a leadership group that kind of runs the page all volunteer run all moms <laughs> um and uh, you know who who truly have no extra time i i'm a mom of three i just started homeschooling the exact same week that this crisis became aware to me um so my first week homeschooling looked a lot different than i thought it would um and so what we're gonna do this spring and summer, what we hope to do is we wanna give as many opportunities for, for paid work as we possibly can. That's truly what they want and they need most. Um, it's the one thing that they can't, they get really, they're having trouble getting um, because of the way our system set up. So we hope to have open air migrant markets in the summer, um, um, hopefully out of Denver Friends Church or other local churches who would like to get involved. We would love to talk to local churches. I've sent over 100 emails to different churches asking them to, to engage in this crisis. Um, so if you out there are connected to a church in some capacity and you want to talk about ways you can get involved, I would love to talk with you. Um, we want to give opportunities for entrepreneurs. There's so many entrepreneurs. And honestly, that is the Hispanic way. My mom's from Mexico City. When I think about a migrant, I know what that means. There's hardworking people, creative people, people who are my family, right? So we have a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of skilled um skilled individuals who have items to sell, lots of delicious food. So we want to do open air markets. We want to do car washes where community members can come and get a car wash um, that would be paid work. In the past, we've done simply Spanish story times where moms um, in the community could come and hear stories read in Spanish by native uh, speakers. And it was a donation-based event. Um, they were very well attended and those um, families left um, with hundreds of dollars in their pockets because this community is so incredibly generous. Um, we have done pop-up barber shops. There's a lot of barbers out there. Um, there's a lot of ways in which we want to, we want to just do what's right. I know there's a lot of rules. I know there's a lot of licensure and there's a lot of things that we have set up in our society that make our society great. And I I don't want to, I don't want to go against that. I'm not trying to break any rules, but what I am trying to do is make sure that little kids don't go hungry. I don't want to wake up every day anymore to 20, 30 new messages in my WhatsApp for people who are in need, who got my number. My, my phone number is passed around in the migrant community uh, in mass in this moment. Um, and while I'm happy to help, I am one mom in this community. We all have a role to play. This is, this is a moment of great economic increase. If you're an employer, I would encourage you to think of ways that you can fill your open positions because you surely have them because everywhere I go is hiring. Um, try and fill that without a traditional employee kind of role. Are there scenarios in which your uh, open role could be um, a contract work position? Someone with a legally owned business can contract the services of someone with another legally owned businesses. LLCs are a great workaround in this moment um, for employment. Um, maybe there's a way that as an employer, you could say, hey, I'm going to pay for someone to get their work permit, or I'm going to help them navigate applying for asylum and getting their work permit, and then I'm going to employ them. We need some mission-minded individuals in our city. This is a this is a moment, my kids have to grow up in this city, you know, and I, I don't want 10, 20 years from now for us to have done it wrong right now, because what our city looks like in 10 or 20 years is going to be is going to be impacted by what we do right now. Will this be a moment of great economic increase, of cultural diversity, of language acquisition, of innovation? Think of what these kids are going to bring to our society. We must act now for the city of the future, the city of our kids. So I'll get off my soapbox. The ways in which you can help right now are great. 
you can do if it's emptying out your closet emptying out your empty out your closet go do that go to birdseed collective or one of the many um, organizations that are taking donations and if you don't know which ones they are hop on to the the highlands moms and neighbors activating migrant support Facebook group, and, and we will share all that information with you. Maybe you want to serve a meal. There's a meal sign up to take lunch and dinner every single day down to the Zunai shelter to feed malnourished people who are who are ready to work. Many of them mothers, new mothers, nursing mothers who need lunch, who need dinner. Go take a meal. Um, maybe you want to help pop up tents and advertise for these pop-up markets. There are, there are a million ideas and ways to help. Another huge one, like Yoli said, is housing. It's housing. Right now, what's available to them is market rate apartments, which are expensive. I mean, I cannot afford most of these apartments. There's no way. Um, so if you do have a spare room or a basement, um, an empty rental, an Airbnb, um, th those can be offered up in this moment. It is beneficial to the migrants. Not only big apartment owners should be making money in this moment, not only quality in and comfort in should be lining their pockets. What about money into our community? How about running out what we have? How about using funds to put back into our own community who is serving so well? Um, Hope Has No Borders is the nonprofit that we started and have not really officially announced, um, but I'm just going to talk about it now. Um, we have high hopes to do a host home program, uh, which which would be doing exactly this. And and if this sounds scary, I'll let you know in this moment, um, as of the beginning of February, it was self-reported that in my community, up to about 500 migrants were being housed in community. Um, so that's already happening. Um, people in my community are opening up their homes, opening up their hearts to this crisis. We're going to have a more formalized process around that, a real lease, real case management and support. And um, that's just one of the programs that we dream about and hope to run here soon. We're probably going to launch on May 1st. So um, so that's <laughs> That's that's the update in this moment. This is an ever-changing crisis, um, and it's important to know that if you're going to get involved in this, you got to get ready to buckle in for a multitude of changes um, at every level, city level, nonprofit level, citizen level, national level. Um, this problem is not going to stop. We don't know if we're in the middle. We don't know if we're near the end. Are we still at the beginning? One thing we know is that when this crisis is over, there will be another migration. We we have to learn to do this right. Thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate all of the um, specific ways that you gave people on helping and, and the broad perspective. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one question we have that's pre-planned, but that I think also answers a bit of a question in our Q&A, because I do want to combine um, questions from both and make sure we're addressing what um, our, our attendees want to know. Um, the question is, in, in conversations about Colorado newcomers, we, we kind of have seen some two-way discrimination. First, we're hearing xenophobic and racist comments. Um, and, you know, this is on our Twitter or wherever um, about how we should help U.S.-born people experiencing homelessness before helping immigrants. And on the other hand, we also hear some people talk about the work ethic or the structural barriers for migrants and imply that this is not the case for people who are already experiencing homelessness here. Um, so... Does anyone have any reactions to those discriminatory perspectives? And Andy, maybe I can start with you because of your experience working in the homelessness sector for a while, however long a while is, sorry. I don't oh, actually gosh. know how long you've been doing it. A decade or so, you know. Um, yeah, I think it's been a really interesting challenge to see how the population of people experiencing homelessness in Denver who may have lived in Denver their entire lives or found their way here several years ago are intersecting with this group of newcomers who are coming and are oftentimes trying to get access to the same type of services. And so there has certainly been a bit of an us versus them kind of mentality sometimes, even among people who are seeking services and having our patients who have been established with us for many years, feeling like we're dedicating resources to a population that perhaps isn't as deserving somehow of healthcare resources and as the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless, 
these folks are experiencing homelessness. We are here to provide health care services and other resources to anyone in our community who is experiencing homelessness and who needs low barrier, low cost access to health care services. And there is no way for us to make a distinction. We are a community health center that is here to provide access to care for everyone in our community. Um, and even when you look at what our sort of federal definition of homelessness that we use within the health center program, someone sleeping on someone else's basement is still homeless. If you don't have a lease and a door and a key of your own, couch surfing is homelessness. That is housing instability. And so we really have to also be focused on not only the short-term stopgap efforts, but what are we going to do long-term to bring stability, not only to this population, but also to everyone who is facing significant economic challenges in Denver right now. It is a very challenging, expensive time to be in this city, regardless of who you are or how long you've been here. And I think you see it among the groups that are here. There are many of us who don't see a distinction between human beings who need care and need assistance. And I think I, it's great to be among these groups uh, and partners here in doing this work. And I think we all just have to keep reinforcing the message that these are our fellow humans and that we are here as service providers in the community to care for other humans. And it's really as basic as that. Yeah. I just say something quickly. Thank you for that. It's, I've definitely seen it. I mean, there isn't a day, maybe a, a, every day or two that I don't have an email or a uh, text or something, especially the decision that was made, uh, you know, a couple of days ago with mayor. But, you know, I think, um, for the same thing, you know, we, we, we've been serving the community, the community that who needs it at that time. So it's been any community, any human, any child has always been part of our, our mission, right? And so it's, it's always been doing that, whether they're, they're already established, uh, underserved children and families. And then when this came around, of course, we're going to help as well. I think it's, it's hard to see because when you can't make everybody happy. So when we started helping here, I've, I've heard many things from other people saying, how come you're helping them? I mean, there has been really some some hard things that they have been said to us. Uh, but again, it's it's the faith that you have in helping human beings when they need it. So, you know, I feel it in my heart that we are doing the best we can. Um, we've done the best we can. And, you know, when somebody needs something from our community, it's always been there. And so there's always that. And so it's not, it's not, it's not new. It's been seven, 18 months of hearing those who don't understand or they feel left out, you know? And so we always, I always say, reach out, how can I help you? So my my answer to those sometimes texts or calls or, you know, things that they put, you know, about our organization is how can we help you, right? So, and, you know, and then I think sometimes they turn around and say, well, let me help you out. This is where you can go if you do have, you know, your citizen over here and you have, a permit of social security or here's what we can do if you don't so but if there is there is that happens so the, we're going to continue on to help those who need um uh, there is no differences to us as well it's human beings children people in our city um and so that that's all i need to say about that one <laughs> so can i chime in too yeah on that question okay I think something that's been very eye-opening is walking side by side with someone trying to go through uh, the immigration process in America. That's something I've never done before. Um, I've always popped my social security number and every form that asks for it and moved along with my life. I did not know the insane amount of barriers that are set up for this population. I didn't know that they couldn't get SNAP. I didn't know that someone with nothing was still not able to ride the bus, maybe the same way a vet can ride the bus. Um, I didn't know that they had access to no federally funded programming. I didn't know that to file taxes for my 
immigrants who want to file taxes and contribute back um, into our society, they need three forms of ID. And to get an ID, you have to show two, two years of residency here. Um, their, their passports and many of their documents are being held back at the border, so they can't go through any process here. I didn't know any of those things. I didn't know. And now that I do know, these are two separate issues. The homelessness problem when you're um, a U.S. citizen, it's also broken. It's also messed up. It's also not right. But there's a whole other pathway. If you're a refugee designated by the U.N., there's a whole other pathway for you. If you're someone who has crossed the border and asked the U.S. to be let in and the U.S. said yes, which is the population we're dealing with, these are, this is not a population of people who have jumped a fence or found a hole. This is, they are trying to go through our process. They have paperwork. I know we like to call them undocumented, but man, do they cling to their paperwork like it is their lifeblood, which is all in English, by the way. It's, it's completely set up for them to be able, for them to fail and to not have a way to go through our system. So I would say to someone who wants to know why are we helping them instead of someone else, that question um, just shows that this is a moment of, of education and an invitation to say, walk with me through what this is really like for someone trying to, to go through our process right now. That's part of this current migration. Um, I would love to learn more about um, the typically unhoused or citizens facing homelessness um, or who need help. I would love to know what resources are out there for them. What I can tell you when I started this is I would stay up till three o'clock in the morning, downloading 170 page guides of 1 million different nonprofits and trying to figure out who exactly was supposed to be helping. Why was it moms in parking lots? Who are the people who are supposed to help? And I have learned through this since November that there's no savior here. There's no there's no plan. There's no single well-funded organization um, who can scale and who can keep going and who can fix this. Again, this is a federal this is a federally caused problem that now has uprooted my entire life, um, and it's making my city less safe. The way that our system is set up, they're trying to hurt. The migrants, um, the, our federal government is is making an attempt to to hurt our to hurt migrants, but in turn it's hurting all of us. And this is something through through walking side by side, through doing direct service, through educating yourself on this process. Um, we need to we need to learn. We need to learn and know um, as community members so that we can vote properly, so that we can take action where it's really needed, so we can understand. There's not just some number I can hand out to someone who needs help. There's not some place I can send them to where it's going to be fixed. Um, this this is a this is a full on failure of our system, um, and, and we're rising to the occasion. Um, but why are we helping them and not someone else? Because they have access to literally nothing, um, and their little kids are just as hungry as my little kids. So that's why we're helping them. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I think that's a really good point, Andrea. That you. Know we didn't cover we often and the reason we didn't add it in our in our pre-slideshow is I know people are like you tell us the same things every month you know so I would encourage folks to go watch our homelessness 101 presentation from March I believe um and you know I will mention that when we did that and we had our health care and housing people you know the housing wait list for a person experiencing homelessness whether they have a family or not is 18 to 24 months right so um, you know, 40 to 50% of people who are experiencing homelessness, who are traditionally experiencing homelessness, are working in the calendar year of their homelessness, right? Like we know that homelessness is tied to a lack of affordable housing. And, um, you know, it's it's still systemic, it's still federal, it's still about like government policies of like, we used to build up housing for everyone. And now 6% of our housing is built um, to be affordable housing and 94% is built to be not affordable housing because the government stopped building housing and we live in a capitalist society, right? So, um, you know, there are systems set up to help people experiencing homelessness, but the accessibility of those systems can be very difficult when that waiting list is 18 to 24. And we do understand why some people say, hey, you're getting migrants housing with a month's rent and, um, you know, able to get sort of in a, a different line when this line is packed. So I think that's why we want to make sure we're giving both sides um, and being able to, without being adversarial, and, and I just use the term both sides, but you know what I mean. Um, 
the problem is that they're, everyone is fighting for the same resources and the resources don't exist in our society, regardless of where you're coming from in need of these resources. Our government isn't meeting anybody's needs um, for housing and for services, regardless of immigration status, but they're each having different barriers depending on whether or not they have status in terms of what's accessible. So I appreciate you talking about it. And I also appreciate that we have tried to have a session where we're talking a little bit outside of our usual, um, you know, traditional homelessness. We've been doing this 40 years and about other individuals who are also by definition um, the exact same to the government in terms of how we serve, right? Experiencing homelessness from a healthcare perspective. So, but thank you. I The answers have been really amazing and thoughtful. Apologize, we are at the end of time. Um, I know that there were some other great questions in the q and I would encourage those folks, feel free to email me, email the folks on the Zoom. I know we have questions about like where you can get um, other resources outside of Denver. We are happy to try to look these things up and respond to you. So I'm so sorry we didn't get to more of our Q&A, but I'm glad we had passionate responses from our um, panelists. And, um, you know, I hope we addressed most of what you were looking for. Um, Gabriella, can you do a final slide share for us? Thank you. Sorry, just going to drop that on you last minute. Or oh, Andrew, sorry, I forgot Andrew was doing it. Um, so join us next month. We're going to talk about mental health and homelessness. I want to reiterate that we do record these. We put them on YouTube. So um, if you want to look into any specific topics, um, please do so. Mental health and homelessness is getting covered next month. We're really looking forward to that one. We'll have some of our um, staff who work in mental health, some from Wellpower, um, people who work in the sector and really can talk about that. Um, we will not have a June education series, but we will have a legislative wrap on May 29th. So my lovely colleagues who work in the legislative process, it's been a long 120 days. We're not done yet, but we'll talk about what happened this session, what didn't happen, what passed that we're excited about, what passed that we're not excited about. Um, and so that's for everyone. Sometimes it's for an ad advocacy network and sometimes it's for other individuals. So um, it's really for, I mean, not sometimes, it is for all of you. So please come um, get ready to dig deep and hear lots of details. Um, and that's it. I want to thank our um, panelists so much tonight. Thank you for coming. I want to thank um, our team here at CCH who helps make this happen and makes the lovely slides and does all the organizing and sends you all the emails. So Gabriella, Shannon, Andrew, Aubrey, um, thank you to our interpreter. I know I talk fast and I am sorry about that. And um, thank you to everyone who came. We know that this is such a choice to spend your Thursday night learning about how to help your neighbors.